and you can take the photograph of someone who's in your party or any person at the bottom of that arch. You can shoot from inside the bowl looking out to the desert and photograph this person standing, their silhouette standing at the bottom of this arch and the arch is just soaring over their head like a cathedral. Welcome to Experiences You Should Have, your how-to guide for amazing experiences. I'm Gail, your host, and today we are talking about Monument Valley, uh, which covers part of Arizona. It's known for its majestic, freestanding sandstone buttes, this vast desert valley of some 92,000 acres on the border of Utah and Arizona stars in Hollywood movies and attracts more than 350,000 visitors per year. And I am interviewing Lynn Smith today. She's been on the podcast many times. She's talked about the Osa Peninsula in Costa Rica, uh, the Milford Sound, Um, drive and boat tour in New Zealand. Definitely go check those out. And, And she is really great about going to maybe popular destinations and figuring out how to do it without the crowds. And I love hearing from Lynn because she researches her trips very meticulously and takes great notes and thought that this would be a perfect episode for experiences you should have. And you should also check out her travel blog. Um, It's lsmith17s.com. Definitely check it out and hope you enjoy the interview. So, hi, Lynn. Thank you for coming on the show. Hi there, Gail. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. <laughs> you are just so much fun. I love how much that you research these trips, that you're actively traveling, you're going on them, and then you're coming back with lots of fantastic notes. Yeah, so today we are talking about Monument Valley. Um, I, I've never been to Monument Valley. I actually just went to the Grand Canyon for the first time uh, a few weeks ago. How was your trip? Oh, it was, it was just stellar. The American West is massive, beautiful. And, um, however many nature programs or Kim Burns specials you watch (laughs) or old Western movies, you just can't believe it till you see it. It's like anywhere else, you know, once you're in the middle of it, the reality of the scale of things, uh, the brilliant colors, the landscape, the people, just everything is um, very all encompassing. Yeah. Now, something that I've noticed that you really specialize in is, is checking out these amazing places around the world while avoiding the crowds. Mm. And uh, that really rings uh, true here. And and would you say that Monument Valley typically receives a lot of crowds? Mm, you know, it's relative. Um, but uh, the, the last numbers I read, which I think date from 2018, is about, what, 325,000 visitors per annum per year. Mm-hmm. Which, which sounds, I don't know, does that sound like a big number or a small one? So if you compare it to the number of visitors to some of our, our and it's the most popular, one of the most popular uh, parks, but not as highly visited as something like a Yellowstone or even a, you know, a Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, a point of reference might be uh, the number of visitors um, coming into New Zealand forecast for like 2020 is about four and a half million people that's a big country you know yeah it's a big country a lot of people but at the same Mm -hmm. time there's i think it's 3.8 million or something people living in uh you know new york the state of new york so i it's really all relative but i would say that um monument valley of the what they call the mighty five which is kind of in there it's in arizona but chunks of it are up in uh, utah the mighty five national parks that one finds in utah which is not what this is about but it touches upon it this interview uh are really very popular they're visited a lot there are a lot of uh, scheduled tours 
uh, international visitors, domestic visitors, lots of buses. But Monument Valley is just so big. And the trick is, if you look at it on Google Maps, it ain't easy to get to. It's not close to anything. Mm-hmm. It's at least three hours drive from mm-hmm. almost anywhere else, right, out in that region. So most people, I think, as a rule, at least try to spend one night, if not a couple of nights, if they're going to do Monument Valley. And uh, so 325 or so uh, thousand visitors per year is not huge, and it's a vast place that can absorb a lot of people. On the other hand, these visitors uh, do tend to be sort of packed into certain key areas, which is where the sites are to see. Isn't that true of our national parks as well? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's where you kind of get the crowds. I mean, from the air, you probably wouldn't see seething thousands of people, right? (laughs) Right, right. When you're on the ground and visiting some of these better known locations within Monument Valley, and you realize that the access to these is kind of limited because of the roads, just, Mm -hmm. you know, few roads lead to Rome. Then you find that, yeah, uh, traffic does pick up and there are some some tactics that I employ to kind of get around that and to get some spaces and quietude and uh, kind of get off the main tourist bus routes, if you will. Yeah, that's fantastic. And for for our listeners who've maybe never been to Monument Valley or they're having trouble picturing what Monument Valley really looks like, um, can you describe uh, what makes this place so special and, and maybe help paint that picture? Sure, happy to do it. So Monument Valley is, you know, adjectives, Dig into your adjective bag and pull them out as you're driving, as you're approaching this area of Arizona and Utah, depending on whether you're approaching from whatever cardinal point of the compass. And you just you just have these landscapes that go on from horizon to horizon. Uh, so ma- majestic, vast, uh, you know, just humongous, <laughs> <laughs> really come to mind as well as, as, well as isolated. You know, you really get a sense of being a very tiny person in this in this large world of ours. When you get out into these distances, uh, because of the desert, it's flat. You know, there's not a lot of relief except suddenly, boom, there's a, a mesa sitting up on the horizon as you're driving or riding along. And you approach this big, fat rock edifice thingy, you know, that's bright red and orange and russet color, depending on the time of day you're looking at it, magenta. And so these rock formations just kind of pop up off this flat desert, not really moonscape, but it's a desert scape. And sometimes it's rolling and sometimes it's different colors, kind of depending on where you are out in Arizona or Utah. So Monument Valley offers lots of faces to the visitor, but the but the most striking impression anyone will get at any time of the year is just the sheer distances that you can see on a line. And if you get a little bit of elevation. Maybe you've come up to a mesa, or maybe you're up on a hill as you're riding along, or maybe you're in the canyon areas. There's canyons everywhere. You're standing on the top, perhaps, looking down into a canyon and across. You can't tell if you're looking 100 feet away, 1,000 feet away, or three states away. There's just, Mm -hmm. the scale is so massive, it's hard to comprehend and get your head around it. Right. Wow. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. And and you've mentioned, you know, it's part in Utah and Arizona. Do you see the landscape change kind of depending what state you're in? Mm, You see the landscape change depending on uh, not just what state you're in, but just kind of where you are in your travels in this region. And I guess I better define the region. The region I'm I'm thinking of and and that I focused on here is uh, the border between Arizona and Utah. Mm-hmm. So if one looks out west, and these are this is one of the eleven, you know, these are two of the eleven western states. People can Google that and figure out what is a western state anyway. You know, oddly enough, Texas isn't one of them. But if you look on Google Maps or any map, you'll see Utah sits just above Arizona, and right there where those two lines meet, just above that line and over to the southeast corner of Utah, is Monument Valley. And if you were to zoom in to take a look at Monument Valley, you would see, oh, I see, it kind of straddles that line. Mm -hmm. So the far right, lower right-hand corner, the far southeastern corner of Monument Valley 
is uh, the lower Monument Valley, if you will, or Easter Monument Valley. That's where the visitor center is. That's where the major road that uh, mm-hmm. most of this area cuts through. That's fantastic. Thank you for, for helping us get geographically oriented here. And, and why should someone visit Monument Valley? Well, it depends on uh, mm-hmm. what you're into in your travels. I think, I think most visitors go there because of the staggering views and the different faces and being out on the desert and seeing these signature buttes and mesas that have featured in mm-hmm. movies, primarily Western movies that are made in the United States and have been made, but also, you know, spaghetti Westerns and other Westerns have been made out here on these uh, on the valley floor of Monument Valley, John Ford started shooting his movies in what 19 in the 1930s and really brought some attention to this area of our country in the black and white uh, Western movies, John Wayne, different movies. And then since then, other movies have been uh, have used different locations within Monument Valley because of these very unique rock formations that have names that just pop up off the desert floor and the high mesas and the far distances that you can see and the, the amazing sunrises and sunsets and starlit nights and canyons. And, you know, you can just picture yourself on the back of a horse riding through, <laughs> riding through this, this desert landscape. It's so romantic. I think it's the romance. I think that's what appeals to people and seeing this area that just don't look like hardly anywhere else on the world. It just doesn't. Uh huh. Oh, wow. Wow. Now, what's the most popular attraction um, in Monument Valley? Um, The center of the activity tends to hover around the visitor center, Monument Valley, which is just way off at the edge of Monument Valley. And but it gives you wonderful views of these rock formations. The key two rock formations are called the mittens, as Mm -hmm. in hand mittens, M-I-T-T-E-N-S. And it, they really do. If you look at pictures on Google Maps or on my blog, you can see it's like a thumb turned inwards and then these fingers sticking up from these rock formations. Those are probably those and other mesas. And there's so many rock formations that are in the area that it's almost too much to see, certainly more to, than you would see in one day. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Now, you went on the Mystery Valley tour. Uh, Can you explain really what this tour uh, encompassed? Yes. So we had planned to spend a couple of nights in Monument Valley, a hotel that's located right there at the edge of the park with um, beautiful views of the landscapes right there and the most popular rock formations. And because we spent two nights, I really wanted to get out on the desert, but not necessarily in a in a jitney or an open jeep with you know 18 or 20 other people following eight or 10 or 20 other jitneys in a you know line of choking dust to go from one you know rock formation to the other and have somebody chat about it i I, that's not the kind of thing that uh really appeals to me and we had enough time that we could craft our own experience so i dug around and, and looked around and I uh, did a lot of searching, and once again, TripAdvisor gave me some hints as to which way I should go along the lines of, gee, if you only have one full day to do in Monument Valley, what should you do? And in a couple of places, this Mystery Valley tour came up. Now, the anybody looking at taking a trip out there would know that there are sunrise and sunset tours that you can arrange anywhere from, I don't know, about $60 a person to $125 a person all of which are led by Navajo guides because you're on a Navajo reservation. You're not Mm -hmm. really in a national park. You're on a reservation. So you have to make arrangements with guides if you want to go out into the desert. And so there are these operators, Navajo families, that organize tours. You can sign up for them ahead of time, pay for them ahead of time online, and schedule them, and show up at the right place at the right time in Monument Valley, typically at the View Hotel, which is where we stayed, where these tours will begin. And instead of doing a sunrise, sort of right around that area of the desert and see the sun rising behind these just outrageous rock formations, or a sunset tour, I chose to take the Mystery Valley tour because it's lesser known. And it really focuses more on, I was like, what does mystery mean? Mystery Valley? What's the mystery? Well, it turns out it's really access on on Navajo land, Bureau of Land Management lands, 
access to and, and places where you can photograph and drive right up to and view ancient Anasazi ruins. So these are the Pueblo peoples who inhabited these areas of the Southwest. Mm-hmm. Uh, think Chaco Canyon, perhaps. Some people have heard of that. So the uh, ancient ones built uh, their homes inside these cliffs and uh, at the ends of box canyons. And they lived in these pueblos and from like 1050 A.D. to 1350 A.D. So and they made their living and, and, you know, managed to cultivate food and find water and so forth uh, way back when. So those ruins are still out there on the desert. They're still tucked into these canyons and up canyon walls. There are petroglyphs and pictographs that you can see. And obviously, if you're being guided as we were by a Navajo guide, this young lady had actually grown up, was raised right there in the area and told us stories that her grandmother told her about the Anasazi. These are oral tradition stories that have come down through the years, the thousands of years. So we got some real insight. And by going out early in the morning on a weekday with our guide, it was just the two of us traveling with the guide. So we had our own private tour for like three hours and she took us Mm -hmm. to the most amazing. I mean, you don't know where you're going. She's not going to tell you anything ahead of time. (laughs) We're just driving along bangity bangity bang through the desert on this dirt road and uh, kind of chilly early in the morning in late September. So we were riding in the truck cab with her, but once we got close to where we were going to be going, she said, Oh, you can jump out in the back there in the seats underneath the, the covered um, area where the passengers usually sit and you'll get a nice view as we approach our the first of several stops and so we did and you're looking out across the desert and you're going down through canyons and the canyons are soaring above you and then you drive very slowly the truck <laughs> is really crawling up rock faces it's incredible <laughs> hang on so you get up to the top of this mesa and the sun only rose like 20 minutes ago so the you know, the shadows are very long. And here we are taking pictures, the three of us. She's also a photographer. So, uh, and we're at this first location called the Pancakes. And we're way up high on a mesa, probably a little over a thousand feet above the floor of the canyon. And we can see all of these fantastic rock formations, the mittens and various buttes and mesas and canyons down below us. And all you can hear is the wind and a, and a hawk was off in the distance calling. It was a movie scene, you know, and just the breeze blowing across and the smell of the sage. And here we were on these strange rock formations that called the pancakes. Again, that really look like giant wet cow patties that had, huh. were freeze dried <laughs> one on top of the other. It's, it's amazing. So we could crawl around on those and get up on top of those and take some pictures and hang out there for a little while. And then, we got back in the back of the truck there, and she drove us on to the next stop, which turned out to be this Anasazi ruin up up, uh, up a hill. It's like we were down in a little bit of canyon, but sort of halfway up the canyon as we approached it. There's this canyon wall, and there's a ruin of a little Pueblo, an area where, oh gosh, anywhere probably from 10 to 12 to 15 people lived. Who knows? Thousands of years ago. But it's still intact. I mean, the pottery and other artifacts have long since disappeared from these areas as you might well imagine but i mean long since but we could take photographs there walk around and just sense the silences feel the silences Mm -hmm. the quiet and have the place to ourselves and we hardly said anything you know you're just kind of captivated by the place in the moment and our guide, if we asked her questions, she would answer us. But she she was so sweet to just let us mm. be absorbed in the moment and then ask her questions as, as they occurred to us. And that was just two of probably, we were out there for three hours, so maybe nine or ten stops at different places, including this just fantastic arch system, mm-hmm. several mm-hmm. arches that are in the area. So that that first stop at the Anasazi ruins was just one of about four or five different Anasazi ruins that she took us to in in kind of a big loop around the section of the uh, lower Monument Valley, which is not accessible to public. Only the Navajo um, guides 
and tribal people have access to these dirt roads. And I don't think you'd be able to find your way around back there anyway, because they are like dead end canyons and one canyon, one road kind of flowing into this canyon. And you're not really sure how you got in and not really clear how you're going to get out. And uh, a bit of uh, riding in the back of this truck was fun because we did clamber up some rocks. But yeah, you kind of had to hold on to the Jesus bar, they call it, this bar that goes across the back of every uh row of bench seats there's like four rows of bench seats in this thing but you could take video you could shoot pictures from the back you had a 360 uh point view and at any point if you really wanted to stop we'd just tap the top of the truck the cab and she would stop and we'd say hey can we go over there sure go over there and photograph this the mystery valley tour is mysterious because it takes you not only to anasazi ruins but also these amazing box canyons, as I said before, sort of connected together. You ride along the desert floor. Next thing you know, you're going down in this canyon and way on into the back of it. And, whoa, here's some more ruins. And here's some petroglyphs and maybe handprints right up against the wall. And our guy was explaining that uh, a couple of the ruin sites that she took us to were actually abandoned at the point at which they were being built. They had never actually been lived there that had been determined through archaeological means over time and study. And then there were other places that uh, we went to that she took us to. There are these different arches. Of course, sandstone arch formations are very well known in the West uh, in various states, but certainly Utah and Arizona are probably most known for these just staggering arch formations. Uh, and they have various names that they've been given over Time, but there was one place called Honeymoon Arch that I was just, I mean, they're all fascinating, intriguing, mysterious, kind of spooky, quiet, long shadows, the breeze moving through the canyon, and you're either looking up at this arch or you're crawling in uh, a bowl. Like, picture this giant bowl sitting on the desert floor and tucked into a canyon, and up in the bowl, if you crawl up there about 30 feet or 40 feet up, there's an arch over your head, and it's a big semicircle like like a big circle and there's an arch over the top and if you go inside the bowl underneath this arch and you look to your left right up against the wall up about 15 feet along the wall there's this kind of curved wall that's built against that wall of that bowl and there's clearly a doorway that's just open and these were um, dwellings were built with uh, just sandstone bricks and rocks and these dates from thousands of years ago it's amazing. So that honeymoon arch was, oh my gosh, we must have spent 40 minutes there or more photographing in the um, mid-morning light because the light was so perfect. Crystal blue skies, cerulean blue, rust red, orange, yellow, sulfur colors in the rocks really showing up as the sun hit them. And half of this dwelling was in the hard sun and half of it was in the hard shade. And you can take the photograph of someone who's in your party or any person at the bottom of that arch. You can shoot from inside the bowl looking out to the desert and photograph this person standing, their silhouette standing at the bottom of this arch. And the arch is just soaring over their head like a cathedral. It uh, just gives me. Yeah. <laughs> <Woo, woo. laughs> oh, this is great. That is absolutely great. So, I mean, the Mystery Valley tour sounds like a must-do tour to have a private experience that's awe-inspiring. Yes, and the secret is, I think, stay in Monument Valley at the right time of year. We could talk about that, which is basically spring and early fall, you know, late spring before it gets too hot and okay. early fall before it gets too cold, but after it's too hot. So we went the last week of September and this year. Uh, it, that was absolutely perfect, just perfect time to go. It's also very popular, mm -hmm. so, so thus the crowds. But um, <laughs> the secret is really for us, we determined that if we can go during the week, a weekday, stay a couple of nights in Monument uh -huh. Valley, you can camp, you can stay at a Hogan, you can look at Airbnb. There are about three or four Hogans around that you might stay in if you want to have that experience. You can stay at the View Hotel, which is like the place to stay because of where they are relative to these massive rock formations. Um, 
But if you go early in the morning, and that's the Mystery Valley tour is offered very early in the morning, like right after sunrise. Your guide will show up at the mm -hmm. View Hotel, and you jump in the truck with her, and off you go. And it's only like a 10-minute ride to get out to that part of the desert that where we began our tour. And mm -hmm. uh, Or there's also an afternoon tour of the Mystery. Same tour, same sort of route, stopping at the same places. But that's more popular because, frankly, if you're a photographer, you're going to want to do both or just the afternoon because the light is perfect, just perfect for photography mm -hmm. at each of these locations, nine out of 10 or whatever locations. But you'll be sharing, you'll, your truck will pull out and another one will pull in behind you, right? And so everybody mm -hmm. will unload, everybody will go out and ooh, take their selfies or whatever, get back in the truck and off you go. So you'll be traveling through more dust, there'll be more traffic, there'll be more people. If you're trying to roll video and get a real sense of the silences and the quietude and peacefulness, you won't be able to get, you know, your audio will be full of voices and, you know, trucks coming and going. That's the reality of mass tourism today. And it was mm -hmm. certainly present in Monument Valley. So the best way to avoid it, weekdays, early in the morning, sunrise. Beautiful. Now tell me a little bit more about the 17-mile loop road. Then the 17-mile uh, loop road, or also called the Scenic Valley Drive, is located at the View Hotel in Monument Valley. Okay. So if you stay at the View Hotel, your access will be immediate, especially if you've driven yourself. You'll be parked there. You can get out in your car early in the morning, beat the crowds, go drive this loop or drive it midday in the heat of the day, which is what we did because we were out early in the morning on a Mystery Valley tour. And in the evening, we mm -hmm. had saved that for our photography and moving to different locations for um, sunset and starlight photography. So midday was perfect to get out in your air-conditioned car and go drive along this 17-mile uh, Scenic Valley Loop Road, which is located, again, right at the View Hotel. So visitors who want to just do that or as part of their Monument Valley visit, they pay their $20 at either the Visitor Center, which is located some miles from the View Hotel, or as they approach the View Hotel, there is a kiosk right there uh, where you can pay $20 cash per vehicle. And then you can access mm -hmm. the 17-mile uh, loop road, and you can either sign up with one of the companies ahead of time online for the uh, loop road drive, ride around in the back of an open vehicle, uh, bench seats, being you know on the back of a truck, and there's a lot of dust, a lot of mm -hmm. dust and wind and grit, so not something I'd want to do. Or if you have your own vehicle, yeah, it's a little more comfortable. And just do it during the midday. Now, you'll join a, uh, a long string of other traffic that's constantly on that road from morning until after dark. But it's so worth it because this it sounds like 17 miles. Oh, so we'll do that in about 20 minutes. Now, you need to allow at least a two and a half hours. Because, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, it's up and down. Uh-huh. Secondly, it's either rock underneath your tires or it's soft sand or it's dirt, slippery. Third, you need you really want to be in a vehicle, a truck or an SUV that gets you up off the ground because in some places you're going to be directing your vehicle over, I mean, literally driving over rocks, across somewhat flat rocks, a row of them out, out there in the middle. That's, that's your road. You're just driving across rocks and you're crawling up them, climbing up them in second gear. So... It's not tough. You don't need a four-wheel drive, but it's not a good idea to take a sedan out there. Mm -hmm. So, and the speed limit is 15 miles an hour, and you'll soon learn that you can't go much faster than that anyway, or you'll rattle your brains out of your head because <laughs> the road is rather wild. <laughs> or it might be it might be gravel in places and just gravel popping up, so you want to be slow. But is it ever worth it when you drive this scenic loop road? When you just, as you approach it, as you approach the view, you're going to see the Mittens, Mittens, M-I-T-T-E-N-S again, and Merrick Butte on your left. Well, these are just, I don't even know how to describe them, but it's the typical scene that you see when you Google Monument Valley. You think of Western movies, you think of uh, book covers, you name it. This is the iconic view. And that loop road runs right in between those mittens, right along there, right in front of the View Hotel. And you jump right on it. You don't have to pay an extra fee or anything. Just start driving the loop road from the View Hotel. And you'll be driving right along the base of 
the West Mitten uh, Elephant Butte, which is, this, I suppose, if it's viewed from a certain angle, it kind of looks like an elephant. I didn't quite see that, mm-hmm. but I kept looking. <laughs> it's Big Butte, which, again, it just looks like a rock set down on the desert, but it's massive. It's like a small city. These things are huge. <laughs> <laughs> just huge. Uh, and you'll see the three sisters and then, you know, so you're slowly driving along and you can get a little brochure there, their view, or you can look up online. There's different ways that'll give you little descriptions of what you're going to see. And you can pull off their pull offs all along the road. And as you move along this road, you get to John Ford's point. This is probably the most iconic view of the Mittens and Merrick's Butte and the desert that has just been seen so many times in the movies. And I guess it was named for John Ford, the director, the movie director, Westerns, 1950s and 60s primarily, but some 40s and 30s. So this is an amazing place to go. There's quite a bit of traffic there. There's ample parking there. But this is where a gentleman, uh, a Navajo gentleman, will get out on his horse that he keeps in a small stable, Mm -hmm. a little corral area right there near the parking area. And he goes trotting out on the end of this butte that has this long finger that sticks out and is way up high above the desert. And you can see forever. And in the foreground is this guy sitting on a horse. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) It's like in a cowboy hat, whatever. And you can take your picture. So, uh, but this view from John Ford's point, especially in the afternoon, if you do these things like after two, the light is going to be so perfect. It's going to be just awesome. And then you get to Camel Butte and some, you know, these names won't mean anything to people. But when they start looking at the map and they're like, oh, let's go to the next one. What's the next one? Oh, it's the hub. What is that? It's 150 feet high. There was a cluster of dwellings at its base. Oh, you mean Navajo dwellings? Yes, we're in the Navajo reservation. And how about Sand Spring, uh, a natural aquifer out in the desert? Wow. You know, that's an important thing for everybody, including the 10 families that still live out. Navajo families that live right out there in Monument Valley who wow. don't have running water, yeah. don't have electricity. So they're, yeah, the source of water for them um, could be, I suppose, always has been this natural aquifer. And then there's, um, oh, I just fell in love with Artist's Point, mm. Artist's Point. And you can see why. It just makes you want, oh, I think I'll be an artist today. Where's my <laughs> easel and my, <laughs> where are my paint? Uh, yeah, I mean, Okay, how do I best describe this moment of words? You'll be able to view from the top of this butte as you drive and you park your car and you sort of start to walk up a slight rise. And as you walk up the slight rise, these tall rocks appear on your right. And it's it's like you can tell you're at the edge of a canyon. And you can tell when you get to the top of this rise that you're probably going to get a mind-blowing view of the desert sweeping away from you and way down below. And oops, you will not be disappointed it just gave me chills when I walked up there in the afternoon and I saw it. I, I didn't know where, I just stood there with my jaw hanging down. Where do I begin to photograph this from? Because there are there are some rock formations that are going up a couple hundred feet off my right shoulder that just kind of go back into this canyon and disappear off my right shoulder. Immediately in front of me and to my left is just this huge flat horizon. And in front of me, dropping straight down, I'm at, this, at the edge of a butte and I'm looking down into canyons below me, 1,000 feet, 800, 900 feet. I don't know. It's hard to tell. And way out there in the desert, I can just see these layers of colors from the horizon line where the bright blue that starting to deepen now because it's afternoon, blue sky, not a cloud in it, sky. And the horizon sort of has this rainbow color effect, like lavender and a little bit of orange out there, maybe some pinks. And it's not sunset. It's just just a reflection of the desert light, I guess, but it's miles away. And you're looking across the desert that looks very much like the painted desert. They're little spotty colors of the different shrubberies and uh, uh-huh. plant life out there. And then to your left is yet another series of canyons kind of folding one into the other. And then uh, mm, mountains sort of looking, buttes, folding mesas, folding one into the other to your left. And you can stretch your right arm and your left arm out as far as you can on either side of yourself and that is your horizon just spectacular and you're you're up at a good elevation so that your photography your angles your viewpoints are uh, many 
spots to choose from. And because Artist Point is kind of towards the end of the loop where you start to loop back on that 17 mile loop road, not many people make it out there. So it's a great place to be in the afternoon. Mm. Now, what about sunset? Where do you want to be for sunset to get the most epic photos? That place I just described, Artist Point, if you're willing to come back to your hotel or get back to the start of the loop road after dark, that would be probably one of the more incredible places to photograph your sunsets from. But um, having scouted that area, I, I could also say that you can photograph from right there at the View Hotel. The easiest, most painless, and probably most iconic shots you'll get are in, are in two places, from the patio at the mm -hmm. View Hotel, looking right out to, once again, the Mittens and Merrick Butte. They're together. This, there are three of them. It's like this collection of three of them, and you can see that loop road in the foreground sort of winding away into the desert. That's the place to get your sunset shot. And by sunset, I mean start shooting, you know, 45 minutes before the sun set time is officially posted because you'll, you'll get all kinds of different lighting effects on the face of those rocks. Those rocks are perfectly lit at sunset from the View Hotel. And if you're not staying at the View Hotel, you can still access the patio right in front of the restaurant and get something to drink, hang out in the restaurant, step out in the patio, take your shots. Um, also, there has of late in the last maybe four or five years, particularly with uh, Instagram kind of promoting these different places to shoot from. There's a, a location called Forest Gump Road, hmm. which is really the road leaving out, leading from the View Hotel or leading out of Monument Valley out to the north. And uh, it's a highway there. I, I'll, I'll send you a link that has the actual GPS and the highway number. But just know that on your way out of Monument Valley, if you're going, as we did, from Monument Valley toward Moab, this is about um, eight miles away from the View Hotel. This is the point of reference on uh, the state road there in front of the View Hotel. And as you drive away from Monument Valley, you keep looking in your rear view mirror, you're like, wow. Wow, wow, especially at 9.30 to 11 o'clock in the morning, that's the time to shoot it. And when you get to this location and you see this scene behind you, it'll be one of those ribbon of highway from the foreground, big and wide, and your foreground going off straight, straight ahead, arrow straight, into this horizon line shot of these magnificent rock formations, the Mittens and Merrick Butte. So you've got the contrast of your morning bright blue sky the orange, red, russet color of the the horizon, the rocks all poking up above the horizon. You've got the desert in the midground, the subtle colors and shades of the desert flora there and the sand of the desert floor. And then you've got this black road with the yellow stripes right up the middle and it's right in the center of your shot. That's called Forest Gump Road. That's a, that's an amazing shot, but it can only be done in the morning. Oh, that's a good tip. Now, let's move over a little bit to logistics. Uh, first off, let's talk about costs. What was the average cost of a rental car uh, for this trip since you mentioned taking your own car? really helped with the comfort of of this type of trip sure um some people start their trip to sort of this area of the southwest maybe monument valley or the town of moab or you know the arizona utah uh, border or even just doing a loop around utah and seeing uh, the canyon lands many people will start their trip from las vegas it's not mm -hmm. unusual just like the people visiting the grand canyon uh because it's uh, you know, Las Vegas, Las Vegas is readily mm -hmm. assessed via air. So we, we did that. We flew in and out of Las Vegas. And we, in our case, we had a total 10-day itinerary for uh, visiting Arizona and particularly Utah. And then coming back, driving back, it was a big loop. So we got a rental SUV out of Las Vegas for, I think, yep, we paid $433 for 10 days kind of what the rates were at the time of year that we went, which was the last week of September, mm -hmm. last 10 days 
of September. And then when you stayed at your hotel in Monument Valley, how much did that cost? This hotel is called The View, capital T, capital V, The View, and it's about a three, it's a three-story long hotel that sits in the most perfect place for photographs off your balcony. Mm -hmm. That's why it's very popular. And uh, I do recommend a third floor room, which is the uppermost room so that you don't have sort of somebody else's, you know, floor sticking out over your balcony. You have a better view of the sky at night, for instance. We stayed there in a third floor room in the last um, in the last week of September for two hundred and eighty nine dollars a night, double occupancy. You can get different configurations in the room for your beds if you want, but that was it, two eighty nine per night. Now, for those with limited mobility who maybe want to stay at the view, um, do they have an elevator in there? Uh, do they have ramps going into the hotel? If you recall, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the tours, the hotel itself, access to the restaurant, which is on the second floor. There are elevators. They are very accessible mm-hmm. and ADA compliant, as best I could see. Uh, you know, you can roll on out to the patio from the restaurant. It's on the same level, which is delightful. Great. It's a great place to hang out. So, yeah, definitely. Also, if you uh, if people end up taking a tour arranging for a tour if they don't happen to have their own vehicle um, you could, you'll be catching your tour from the view hotel and it's easy on board you know easy transfer from the hotel to the front of the hotel to get on board and and you can take that 17 mile loop or get on your sunset or sunrise or mystery valley tour or whatever it is that you choose to do they're certainly very helpful in accommodating everyone that they possibly can there Great. Absolutely. Fantastic. I love, I love hearing that. And as far as uh, like food and water, um, you know, what were you eating while you were there? I mean, were there places to eat? Um, How much water did you need to bring in? Because we were on an extended excursion, 10 Uh days, Uh you know, we we were at different places along the way, different uh, towns where we would pass through or stay. Where we had facilities, we would normally grab a few gallons of water and keep them in the car. (laughs) That's what we do when we travel through desert environments anyway. We just Mm -hmm. always like to have lots of water with us. And we absorb a lot. But you can drink the water there, no problem. I mean, tap water is no problem. You can eat at the View Hotel. They have... uh, Great breakfast, lunch, dinner, full service restaurant, okay. no problem. Or, uh, but there aren't any convenience stores or anything like them. Mm. Uh, again, think of Monument Valley is out in the middle of nowhere. So you, whatever you think you want, if you have protein bars or particular uh, snacks or foods or something like that, or uh, that you want to bring with you, maybe you want to bring a cooler. Maybe you want to have ice in it. Maybe you want to have a few gallons of water that you can, you know, if you want to make your own coffee in the morning or whatever your deal is. But whatever you're bringing, get it well in advance of coming into Monument Valley. Again, if you look at the map situation and you see what kinds of towns and facilities there are nearby, really the nearest facilities to get gasoline and that sort of thing are at the entrance to Monument Valley near the Monument Valley Visitor Center. There's a highway right there. And it's sort of, you know, a couple of gas stations, a couple of uh, quick serve restaurants right there. I think there's even a McDonald's I remember seeing. So, yeah. But once you drive into Mon- Monument Valley and drive into the view, which is a good 30 minutes plus away from the Monument Valley Visitor Center, you're on your own, except what the restaurant has and vending machines and their little gift shop there. Mm. Now, for our digital nomads who depend on having access to cell service and Wi-Fi, um, were you able to get a, a good signal there in Monument Valley? No. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're at the View Hotel, yeah, Wi-Fi was in the rooms uh, and in the restaurant, and it was good. Didn't have any problems. Uh, mobile cellular service, not so much, depending on your carrier. But really, I mean, you're, just, you're not going to see a lot of cellular towers popping up all around you. You're out in desert lands and canyon lands. And while there is cellular service, it's, it was quite spotty. Um, and in fact, throughout the American West, I would, I would just tell people that you probably want to have some maps with you or have downloaded your maps to your phone or whatever your device is before you actually get out there in those desert landscapes and start those long drives 
because you can't count on having mobile service everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. Now, what about gas? Were you able to gas up in Monument Valley? Uh, No, we ran out of gas like four times. Okay, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, uh, we gassed up um, when we came into Monument Valley, I think just before. And again, there's, like I said, the gas station um, convenience stores, some quick serve restaurants, that sort of thing, small sort of collection of them at very near the visitor center on Uh that highway. As you turn away from the visitor center and start begin to drive into Monument Valley, just one road leads in there. Mm -hmm. So one road in, one road out. Uh, So you need to get everything right there near the visitor center that you might have, including gasoline or other provisions. Now, how far in advance should you plan this trip? Well, I was planning this trip in March and April and May and kept updating information. I tell you, planning this trip because it was 10 days, quite a bit of driving, trying to figure out places, hidden places, hidden gems, finding them, Mm -hmm. figuring Mm -hmm. out how to get there without having to have multiple days of four or six hour driving took me as much time as it took me to plan my trip to New Zealand. Which wow. is saying something, logistics. But I was the driver. The total amount of driving that we did across 10 days was about 1,600 miles. Great big loop out of Las Vegas into Arizona, up into Utah, back to Las Vegas. So this Monument Valley segment was just one segment of a multi-segment trip. So it mm-hmm. took it took a while. And the trick is some staying at a place like the View Hotel or if you want to stay at any of the national parks, if you're planning to do those kinds of trips, or you're coming into popular towns like Moab, or you're coming into small towns along your route that you may have planned for. If you're hikers like we are, we get out there in the boonies. We may stay in smaller places. We might be looking for Airbnbs. In that case, not a whole lot to choose from. So I think you want to run a minimum of four weeks, uh, four months ahead of your trip. Okay. Plan minimum that far in advance and make your reservations at the more popular hotels or Airbnbs that you might find. Oh, that is fantastic advice. Now, what should you bring or what's something that you're really happy that you brought or something that you forgot you wish you had? <laughs> we thought about that a lot. Um, what was I glad I had brought? You know, I'm not one for hats. I might wear a ball cap or something, but I knew we were going to be out in the sun, the unremitting drying wind that sucks the moisture out of you. So we were very happy to have more than one water bottle, especially if we were out hiking. And I was particularly happy to have a a substantial broad brimmed hat. So I went Western. I went cowboy, kind Hmm. of cowgirl on that one. But um, it just makes sure a ball cap will not protect your neck and it won't protect your ears. Sunscreen, we were happy to have our sunscreen. We used it liberally. And hat, head covers, just absolutely required water. Take more water, drink more water. If you're used to hiking in other environments and not the desert, and you say, oh, this water bottle will do us just fine for, you know, the next three or four hours, uh-uh, take another water bottle, trust me. You need it. You'll be dehydrated before you know it because the wind also sucks the dry air and the wind that's perennially blowing uh, a breeze to a wind. It's very dry, very low humidity. So you your skin will get crinkly. Mm-hmm. You will dry up mm-hmm. like a prune. So you really want to drink a lot more than you ever think you're yeah. going to be drinking. Wow. wow. And do you have uh, just some final tips uh, for our experience seekers out there um, who are putting this on their itinerary? Mm, yes. Uh, don't be a bit surprised if windstorms pop up. Uh, we ran into them in more than one location, and, and, and they're not indigenous to certain times of the year. So uh, just keep an eye out on the weather. Plan for the right time of year to go, and know that if you pick the time when it's cool enough to to hike in the morning and uh, nice enough in the evenings where you're not freezing to be outdoors in the wind, taking your photographs or whatever, you're probably going to be there when other people want to be there. So uh, plan for some traffic at, at the more popular spots, Tra- plan for a lot of people at the national parks, go very early in the morning, 
Uh, get your national, any passes you can get a national park pass for retirees, any other special deals that you can possibly find. Make your reservations well in advance for places to stay <laughs> because you just don't have a lot to choose from out there. Um, and be mindful of your water use. You know, I mentioned those 10 families, uh, Navajo families that still live in Monument Valley, and they don't have running water. So, um, you know, they have solar cells, many of them, which is great. It's awesome. But um, so don't expect swimming pools and spas in places yeah. where you stay. Be mindful of your use of water. And again, I think it's really important. I'll just reiterate the importance of if you're going to rent a vehicle, go ahead and get an SUV or something that'll get you off the ground. Forget about the Dodge Charger. They're, they're really trying to uh, promote those at these rental centers, look sexy or whatever, but it's just not practical. Get okay. yourself up off the ground and, and enjoy some safety when you're yeah. driving. Oh, well, thank you so much, Lynn. I truly appreciate it. I, I love how you research. I love how you travel and and get off the beaten path a little bit. And um, this is just going to be some great information for our listeners and readers. If you go to experiencesyoushouldhave.com, click on episodes, and you will see some well-written show notes there um, covering everything that was said today and more. Thank you for having me, Gail. I, I so enjoy your podcast anyway, and I appreciate being a guest on yours. So thank you so much. Uh, well, we will have you on more because I want to learn more about this 10-day trip and where you went next and how to kind of make it happen. Okay. Thank you. That sounds cool. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to Experiences You Should Have. Uh, please tell a, a friend, a coworker, um, anyone that you might be near right now, that stranger staying next to you in the coffee shop as you listen to this, you should tell them. Listen to and subscribe to Experiences You Should Have podcast. Uh, we are always looking for new ideas, new episode ideas. Um, hit us up on experiencesyoushouldhave.com and please check out the show notes on experiencesyoushouldhave.com. We do a, a nice write-up of each episode containing links, photos, and um, the information that you would need to have to start planning your next adventure. So until your next adventure, adventure seekers, I can't wait to hear where you are going next.